Hello and welcome to PlayStation Access, my name's Rob and if you watched my impressions video this week, you'll know I'm obsessed with Final Fantasy 16. It's a game where poor Clive Rosfield is put through the emotional ringer, but I hope to save you from a similar fate with some expert tips. I'll cover how to level up faster, how to make more money, which quests to prioritise and reveal a few iconic abilities that will make life much easier for you. Whether you're a seasoned action pro or never touched a sword in your life up until now, we've got everything you need to ensure you get the most out of the game. If you're looking for something specific, we've got time codes in the text description. And if you find the video helpful, click the thumbs up and subscribe to PlayStation Access for more videos like this. One of the best things about Final Fantasy XVI is that you don't need to grind. The game is carefully paced so that you're evenly matched with the story. Even doing all the side quests will only pull you ahead a level or two. But if you want to speed things up, you'll want two accessories that go on sale after the second time jump. From the mission Sid the Outlaw onwards, you can visit Karen in the Hideaway and buy On Fortune and the Heavens that boosts XP gain by 15% and the Wages of Warcraft, which increases ability points earned by 20%. Note that Wages of Warcraft only applies to regular battles. When you find yourself next to an obvious boss battle arena, unequip it for something that'll do more damage in battle. Of course, Karen isn't running a charity, you will need to fork out 20,000 gil for those trinkets. You might be missing some obvious money-making opportunities. Make sure to sell any gil bugs, black blood or goblin coins you've been collecting to Karen or any other trader. You got out else? Also, don't sit on materials like sharp fang or magic ash. You collect hundreds, if not thousands of these, and they are only used for lower level sword and armor crafting. Talking to Blackthorn shows you exactly how much you need. You can safely sell the rest, which can add up to quite a tasty little purse. Of common ingredients, the exception is wirite. You will need lots of this in sword forging, so hold on to it. Finally, the sword and armor progression in the game is quite linear. You're always working towards obviously better kit, so don't worry about selling old equipment for extra coin. A quick tip next, when you're looking through Blackthorn's upgrade charts, you'll begin to see ingredients with a small icon next to them. This means the ingredient needs to be earned from one of the game's notorious marks, which are flagged on the Moogle's bounty board. A quick note on finding your targets, the hunt board tells you the correct region, but you need to read this text to learn exactly where to go. Look for location names and then cross-reference them on the map. Zooming in reveals more detailed locations. Once you get to the general area, some monsters like these soul stingers are obvious to the eye, but others like this malicious jello need to be triggered. An easy way to sniff them out is to ride around on your chocobo. Not only do you cover more ground, but when you get in the vicinity of a target, Clive will automatically dismount, confirming that you're in the right spot. I imagine at this point some people are shouting, you can ride a chocobo! Yes, but they come a little later in the game, after the second time jump. When you complete the mission Release, you'll spot a marker with a green plus symbol. This starts the quest The White Winged Wonder, which results in finding lovely Ambrosia. Time for Fast and the Furious Chocobo Drift. Yes! A wider tip here, the side quests with a green plus symbol will always add a bigger feature to the game. Things like increasing Clive's healing potion stash, adding recipes to Blackthorn's forge, or permanently upgrading the potency of those potions. So make sure to prioritize those over the regular side quests that only reward you XP, renown, or gil. Now we get to the juicy stuff, combat. The beauty of Final Fantasy XVI is that you can craft your own build and combat dramatically changes as a result, but there are a few basics that are worth noting. First of all, pick the right order to tackle enemies in big group fights. You should always be prioritizing magic users first as they can heal their friends and coat them in shields. In time, you'll come to know magic users by sight, but look for enemies with staffs or with the blue casting glow. Use lunge or Phoenix Shift to get over to them and pummel them quick. We then like to get rid of aerial pests. Use Clive's Phoenix Shift to pull him up and press X and Square to slam them down with a down thrust. Or use Garuda's Deadly Embrace to yank them out of the sky. Or tap down on the D-pad to have Torgal grab them from the air. 
We then clear up any smaller enemies without a will gauge. It's easier to focus on dangerous bigger creatures without the horde getting in the way. You can get a bit of distance from bigger enemies using Clive's lunge and magic burst combo, hit triangle just as the lunge connects. You can chain this together to stop an enemy from ever finding their feet. Every enemy has a different attack rhythm and the best way to master them is to head to the Arete Stone in the Hideaway. Yes, it's a bit obvious to say practice makes perfect, but the Hall of Virtue tutorial mode is truly excellent. You can summon any attacker you faced from the training menu and get to know their moves in a more intimate setting. Away from the din of the battlefield, it's easier to observe how enemies behave in the run-up to a big attack or what their different moves are called, so when the attack names appear in the field, you know how to react. It's a great place to practice the tricky parries. You need to connect the end of a sword swing just as your opponent attacks and the timing is tight. Better to make rookie mistakes here than filling a graveyard with Clives in the outside world. Another cool feature of the Hall of Virtue is the option to add an on-screen indicator to help teach the timing of a magic burst. This is a handy little move as it basically adds a spark of magic to your sword attacks, slightly juicing your damage output across the board. You can perform a magic burst on every swing of Clive's common four-hit combo, making it eight hits. You can perform one at the end of a lunge, and then again, and again, and at the end of a down thrust, pulling enemies down to the ground with a bang. With the on-screen cue helping you master the timing, why not squeeze out that extra damage? And speaking of squeezing out extra damage, Torgal's sick attack, mapped to up on the D-pad, is much stronger if you time it at the end of Clive's combos or during precision dodges. Again, you can practice the timing of a perfect sick in the Hall of Virtue. Like the burst timing indicator, you can see exactly when you tap for a nasty bite. Go get him, boy! Everyone swears by different iconic abilities, but this is our video, so you have to listen to our suggestion. A move everyone needs in their arsenal is Ifrit's Will of the Wikes, a shield of fireballs that has three huge uses. For starters, it acts as an extra layer of shields. Every time Clive takes a hit, he loses fireballs instead of health, which is always handy. Upgrade it and he can nullify up to four attacks. Secondly, it's an extra layer of offensive moves you never have to think about. As long as you are near an enemy, you're doing damage. Not a lot of damage, but enough to add to your normal combos and abilities to speed up the hurt. Third, it's good for landing fast hits on a staggered enemy which drives up that damage modifier. So pretty spicy. And that's before pairing it for a deadly combo. Where Will of the Wikes really comes to life is paired with Lightning Rod. This is one of Ramu's iconic abilities and I absolutely adore it. It drops a rod that sends out a spark every time you or an enemy hit it. Dropping it next to a larger enemy means they'll hurt themselves with their own moves, which is very handy when fighting brutes the size of a bus. But the really cool trick is pairing it with Will of the Wikes, as Clive's fast-moving fireballs will trigger the rod too, meaning you surround yourself in an orb of electric discharge. Drop it in the middle of a gang and regular enemies are atomized. Activate it by a boss and their will gauge melts away. Even better, trigger Lightning Rod and Will of the Wikes by a staggered enemy and the damage multiplier flies up. Honestly, wherever you use it, this pairing is shockingly good. Talking of staggered enemies, here's how to make it a staggering success. To recap, beefier opponents have a will gauge, the yellow meter you chip away with every attack. Empty it and the enemy staggers. They can't attack you and you can multiply damage. It's a tight window of opportunity though. Our basic aim for a stagger is saving the most damaging iconic abilities until you've maxed out the damage multiplier. The temptation is to spam abilities to stagger the enemy, but the cooldown leaves you with no big hitters for the stagger itself. When there's a fifth of a stagger bar left, I'll hold back abilities and switch to Burning Blade and Down Thrusts to whittle away the last chunk. To raise the multiplier, you want attacks that land hits quickly. Of the earlier icons, my favourite is Garuda's Gouge. Mash the button to extend the attack and land more swipes. But once you get Will of the Wikes, that's my obvious pick. Again, even better paired with Lightning Rod. 
With this move driving up the multiplier, you can also maximize the damage by triggering Limit Break at the start of the stagger and by consuming a Strength Tonic to raise Clive's attack. These are helpful at any time in the fight, but paired with the multiplier, you'll eat through health bars. Then, for the grand finale, I have Ramu's Judgment Bolt equipped, ideally the upgraded version as it hits twice. Dropping this sucker with a 1.5 multiplier is almost comically overpowered. Finally, more of a reminder than a tip, Final Fantasy XVI lets you experiment with new abilities and builds by resetting points on moves you've upgraded and mastered. Just hold square and you refund the points to try elsewhere. Mastering an ability lets you pair it with another icon. For example, I use Phoenix, Ramu and Titan, but like to keep Garuda's Gouge in the mix for staggering. But don't feel the need to master every move there is, only if you want to use it elsewhere. Pressing Triangle over an ability lets you read in great detail what happens when you upgrade each move. It's really useful for prioritizing your next purchase. Hopefully, with all of these tips under your giant medieval belt, you're a Final Fantasy 16 Pro. If you have any advice you'd like to share, feel free to stick it in the comments. Then like the video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you'd like to see more content like this, and hit that notification bell to make sure you are always up to date with everything from the world of PlayStation. Thanks for watching.